a great deal of the homeostasis that occurs, making sure the organs comply. Remember, we talked about some of the parts of the central nervous system that help play a role in homeostasis, but just because they make a decision, uh, now we have to have organs, or we have to have other parts of the body actually do something to maintain homeostasis, which means now we have to get messages all throughout the body. A great way to get a message all throughout the body is to put it in the blood, because the blood pretty much comes in every tissue, comes in contact with every tissue in the body. So if you put a message in the blood, it will get somewhere else in the body very quickly. It's not as fast as central nervous system messaging. It's not that quick, but it's still pretty fast. Now, uh, what the body does as a chemical message, the body uses uh, hormones. That's what a hormone is. A hormone is a chemical message that is released into the blood to go and tell something else to do something deliver this message. It is the message. So we have an organ or a gland that is going to send a message to another organ or gland to do something. In this case, it's going to send a stimulatory message. This message is a hormone that tells this organ or gland to do something. There's also the possibility of sending something called an inhibitory hormone. And the message in an inhibitory hormone is specifically to not do something. An example of that would be if you're coming home from the grocery store and you're carrying groceries in from the car. You can tell your wife or your husband, uh, please shut the door. I've gotten all the groceries in. And that would be a message to tell your husband or your wife to do something. At the same time, you could also tell your husband or wife not to do something as you're walking. You could say, don't shut the door. I have to go back outside. So you're telling them, you're telling your husband or wife or whatever, a message specifically not to do something. That's what an inhibitory message is. So for right now, we're going to follow, follow um, pathway of stimulation because we have this organ or gland that sends this hormone tells this organ or gland to do something and this is how it works this is how it works in the endocrine system it works in a chain reaction sort of fashion we have an organ or gland that releases a hormone that tells another organ or gland to, to release a hormone that tells another organ or gland to do something. We have this chain reaction. And the thing about this chain reaction is uh, if something goes wrong in this chain, uh, this guy is not going to get the right message. And additionally, we have a feedback mechanism where this guy gets the message and tells this guy, Thanks, I got the message, now stop sending me your message. Or he might send it all the way back to this guy and say, Thanks, I got the message, now stop sending your guy your message to the red guy so he'll stop sending his message to me. <coughs> now, this is interesting uh, because we this is what we call negative feedback, right? It's telling it to do the opposite. It's saying, I got the message, now stop sending the message. So to do the opposite of what it's doing. There's also the possibility of something called feed forward or positive feedback, where this guy gets the message, says, I got your message, now keep sending more. Good message. Okay. You might, might be able to see now that this gets confusing very quickly. Uh, what you don't see is the dimension that this is working. Right now you're seeing it in two dimensions, but it actually works in three or four dimensions. Even. What I mean is that this hormone that is released to tell this guy to do something, in this pathway, tells this guy, says, okay, I want you to send a message. But the same hormone that's released in the blood might come in contact with other tissues, 
which might be included in another pathway to tell something else. It needs to be done. And that same hormone, that is the stimulatory hormone in this pathway, stimulatory hormone in this pathway might also be an inhibitory hormone in yet another pathway. That means if you give your patient a hormone or something that alters the hor a hormone, <coughs> for instance, this hormone, or maybe this hormone, or maybe this hormone, it's going to alter it not just in this pathway, but it's also going to alter it in this pathway. So whatever this pathway was going to do is now going to be changed, and whatever this pathway wasn't going to do, it's now going to happen. This is why the endocrine system gets very, very complicated. If a person comes in and they say, you know what, my blue star is not working very well. I got blue star problems. What are we going to do? First thing we're going to do is we're going to check their blue star, see if it's functioning properly. If this is functioning properly, well, maybe it's this hormone right here that's not correct. We have to check this hormone. Or maybe this hormone's correct, but it's just not getting sent correctly, so maybe this is wrong. Or maybe this is wrong. Or maybe the problem's back here. Or maybe the problem is right here. <laughs> this guy's sending a negative feedback saying, I got your message, now stop sending the message even though he never got the message. That's why this message, that's why it's not going on doing his job. Or maybe this should be sent, saying I got your message and I'll stop sending the message, but it's never being sent, or it's not right. So you just keep getting the message, getting the message, getting the message over and over. You see why the endocrine system can get very, very confusing very, very quickly. It can, but it's awesome. Now, this is why when your patient says to you, why do they have to run so many of these blood tests? What are they looking for? Well, we're looking at this, and we're looking at this, and we're looking at this. We gotta look at this, we gotta check this one too. That's why all those tests are being done. <coughs> Endocrine system is, is difficult and confusing, but very cool. Bunch of organ or glands secrete chemical messages into your bloodstream. What do we call those chemical messages collectively? Hormones. 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 Endocrine gland. Endocrine system is all about hormones. Endocrine. Hormones, which means released into the blood, not out into a space. But it's released into a space, and we call it something like the exocrine. Many glands you will find, like the hypothalamus, pancreas, have multiple functions. Many of the endocrine organs have lots of different functions. Many other organs have endocrine functions as well. So you'll hear about the heart having an endocrine function, you'll hear about the liver having an endocrine function, kidney having an endocrine function. All right, here are some of the main components. Uh, these are considered the main parts of the endocrine system. They are the pineal gland or the pineal body, up in the brain, we saw that, part of the diencephalon. The hypothalamus, also part of the diencephalon. The pituitary gland, which is actually two separate glands that happen to grow next to each other. The thyroid, uh, right down here in the neck, right behind that we have find uh, a couple little pieces of tissue called the parathyroids, on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. The thymus, which is unique because this is the one tissue that actually gets smaller as we get bigger. Remember we talked about the thymus before, located behind the bones of the sternum. The pancreas, located just behind the stomach. Uh, the adrenal glands on the superior aspects of each of the two kidneys and the ovaries and the testes, the gonads. What some of these do? Hypothalamus. The hypothalamus does a lot. Uh oh. Oh, that was not effective at all. <laughs> yeah, the blue star is going to be there for a while. Hypothalamus. Um, hypothalamus releases a lot of hormones. It actually releases a lot of releasing hormones. So you'll notice when you go into a little more detail, you'll find a lot of the hormones come from hypothalamus have the term releasing. In them. Uh, of course, also it's part of the central nervous system. 
the hypothalamus, <coughs> I'll keep drawing over here, the hypothalamus right here, the hypothalamus has a little stock, I think I showed you this stock, right, which connects to the pituitary gland, this would be the posterior pituitary, the neurohypophysis and the adenohypophysis. You'll hear those names as well. Uh, most people just call this the pituitary gland, uh, little pea side gland, even though it's actually two separate glands. There's a posterior and anterior portion. Notice there's this little stock that connects to it from the hypothalamus. That's because although the hypothalamus releases a lot of hormones, the two that we will talk about are going to be antidiuretic hormone, ADH, and oxytocin. And both of these hormones are made in the hypothalamus, but they are stored and released in the posterior pituitary gland. Uh, you will see uh, problems with this in different types of head trauma, where this stock, this little connection, could actually be severed, which means the person would not be able to, re to release um, antidiuretic hormones because it gets released from here, not from here. So if it can't make its way here, then it can't be released, and the person doesn't have enough antidiuretic hormone. End up with something called diabetes insipidus. Hypothalamus, connecting to the uh, pituitary gland. Hypothalamus, the ones I want you to remember that are made in the hypothalamus, the sore in the posterior pituitary gland, are ADH, the antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin. Oxytocin is our friend. The pineal body or the pineal gland releases melatonin, not melanin, not the pigment, melatonin. Melatonin is responsible for the sleep-wake cycle, the wake-sleep cycle, the circadian rhythm. You ever wonder why at night you get tired, in the morning you wake up? Uh, the darkness, the uh, absence of light, better, causes the, uh, the pineal to release melatonin, serotonin, melatonin, and that causes us to get drowsy, causes us to be tired, also changes our mood a little bit. Uh, this is why you'll hear patients have a condition called SAD, seasonal affective disorder. Uh, when you talk about the long nights that we're going to face here shortly in the winter time, there are short days, we have less daylight time, we have more darkness. Ever wonder why in the winter time you get tired? You have no energy, you just want to lay around, eat you know, carbohydrates, sleep. And then when the spring comes, you want to get up and get outside and move around. Well, it also affects mood. And so some patients will have uh, some kind of depression during these winter months. And all we have to do is get them more light the pituitary gland, two different glands. Neurohypophysis, or the posterior pituitary gland. Adenohypophysis, or the anterior pituitary gland. <coughs> Lots of different hormones coming from the uh, pituitary glands. Again, the two for the posterior pituitary gland being ADH and oxytocin, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. These are both actually made in the hypothalamus and then stored and released from the posterior pituitary gland once again. Uh, the anterior pituitary gland is going to be releasing a bunch of hormones, everything from thyroid stimulating hormone, uh, prolactin, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, um, melanocyte stimulating hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, just to name a few. The thyroid, the thyroid is going to release uh, a couple of hormones here called. T3, also known as triadothyronine, and T4, also known as thyroxine. I really recommend you, if you know the, the name, uh, the letter and number name, rather than the long name, because you don't see these a lot. You'll see most people abbreviate triadothyronine, but it's good to know that both triadothyronine is T3, uh, thyroxine is T4. Both of these hormones do the same thing. They both increase metabolism. One is just more um, 
say efficacious. What's the word I want for? Potent. That's a good word. One is more potent than the other. T3 is more potent than T4. We understand what potent means, right? Potency. Like, like uh, a shot of beer versus a shot of, uh, shot of beer. A shot of whiskey versus a bottle of beer. They both have about one ounce of alcohol in them, but which one is more potent? The whiskey. So, you know that. Later. Uh, also, thyroid releases calcitonin. Calcitonin is important <coughs> with um, blood calcium regulation. <coughs> Helps to get that calcium stored in the bone. If we have too much calcium in the blood, we want to get rid of some of it. We're going to have calcitonin. It's going to call for those specialized bone cells, osteoblasts, remember those things that build up the bone? And they're going to add this calcium into the bone. Well, the parathyroid uh, glands release a hormone, easily called parathyroid hormone which does just the opposite. This is a hormone that says uh, we need to get that calcium out of the bone and release it back into the blood again. So of course it's going to use that osteoclast, which is going to collapse the bone and release the minerals into the blood. So you see how calcitonin and parathyroid hormone are working against each other. That is called antagonism. Whereas thyroxine and triadothyronine, T3 and T4, are working together in synergism. They both do the same thing. One is just more potent. And by the way, T3 is released um, in a much lower number than T4, like one-fifth. But it can be converted if necessary. One of the things we need uh, to make the thyroid hormone is something called iodine. And where do we get our iodine in the United salt. States? Salt. 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 Remember, we add it to our salt here in the United States. Not everywhere does that. Not every place in the world does that. And the reason we do this is so that our thyroid can function properly and make thyroid hormones like they should. Which is amazing that somebody had the thought to say, let's put iodine with our salt. And then that way, everybody will get exposed to it, and everybody will be able to have a nice, healthy working thyroid, and we won't be all goitered out. I don't think that's a term. The pancreas. The pancreas is located posterior to the stomach. The pancreas plays a big role in digestion. It is tucked inside the loop of the duodenum, the first part of the small intestines. And the reason for that is because it does release a lot of digestive enzymes into the small intestines. But there are, uh, there's an area of cells called the islets of Lagerhans, have you heard of these? And the pancreas, the alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, for instance. The alpha cells release a hormone called glucagon. Glucagon is a hormone that is released in the well-fed state, no, sorry, the starvation state, reverse that. In the starvation state, glucagon is released in the starvation state. Uh, insulin from the beta cells is released in the well-fed state. That's correct. Because glucagon is going to call for that glycogen to be broken down into sugar when we need blood sugar, when we need that fuel, um, our pancreas is going to release the glucagon, which is going to call for the glycogen to get broken back down. Remember, glycogen is a quick storage form of glucose, the hall closet. All right. Well, it's going to call for that to get broken back down into glucose. Whereas, if we are in the well-fed state, like some of you are now after the last lunch break. If you're in a well-fed state, our body is going to release insulin. Why? Because we got lots of glucose, and what are we going to do with it? We've got to deliver it. And who's our delivery guy? Insulin. insulin. 
We're going to take it to the cells that need it, and we're going to take it to storage. The only way we can do that is with delivery guys. You see how these two work opposite one another. Insulin from the beta cells. This is released during the well-fed state. It is going to deliver the glucose. Insulin and glucagon are antagonists. They work opposite. I don't usually like using the terms well-fed or starvation state because a lot of times when people hear starvation state, what's the first thing they think of? They think of that guy who's been on a life raft for six days, that has nothing to eat or drink, you know. He happens to have a little volleyball with him. And that's just not the case. Because really, you know, you're gonna use up most of your blood glucose within a couple of hours, within two to four hours. You're gonna burn through your blood glucose. And then when you, then you start hitting your glycogen stores, when are you gonna run out of that? About 24 hours is when you're gonna run out of glycogen. That's why it's important that we eat on a regular basis. Because then you're gonna, you know, after they start running out of fuel, we got, now we gotta break down other stuff, right? Now we gotta start using the fat and muscle. The muscle first. Yeah. All right, so now we have a little bit of these. Ovaries and testes, as a part of the endocrine system, are going to release things like estrogen and testosterone, progesterone as well. Hormones released into the bloodstream travel all over your body, some affecting millions of cells simultaneously. Their effects last for minutes or even hours, possibly days. Many hormones are secreted all the time. The amount secreted changing as needed. So again, you can kind of see some of this stuff working like that shower at home, where you have the hot water and the cold water both working together. There are going to be times, however, when somebody flushes the toilet, <coughs> you got to turn one way down and turn the other one up just to compensate for that. A nice little chart comparing neurotransmitters and hormones. A lot of similarities. Neurotransmitters, hormones, both chemical messages. Uh, bind to your cells the same. Neurotransmitters control cell excitation. Hormones control cell activities. Uh, the thing about some of the hormones, they don't have to bind to the outside of the cell. They actually will go right through the cell membrane. Those steroid hormones go right through the cell membrane and they'll bind uh, in, in the cell or in the nucleus. A little bit easier. All right, it's a good stuff. Uh, the target for, for hormones, of course, are farther. Talked about the steroids, our lipid molecules can pass easily through the cell membrane, allowing them to interact directly with the cell's DNA to change cell activity. <coughs> Remember, the DNA is the directions, so these hormones can go in and they can start uh, reading and producing things directly from the DNA very quickly. Steroids. Carefully regulated. Not surprisingly, the amount of hormone release depends on how much you need. Many of the chemical and physical characters of your body have a standard level of a set point. In other words, our blood sugar always has to be at that same amount. What's a, what's a normal blood sugar? Anybody know the numbers? Uh, the new numbers. Yeah, it just keeps going down. It's going to be like four to seven in a few days. No. It's uh, somewhere, it used to be uh, 90 to 110. And then, it, well, now it's more like 80 to 100, or even 70 to 100 is the newest numbers. But what is that? 80 to 100 what? Milligrams per deciliter. Does anybody know the right answer, Dave? 
Milligrams per deciliter is correct. So that's what it should be, right? That's what we'd say is a good average. So our body has a way of keeping our blood glucose always in that range. Why? What's the purpose? Sorry? Homeostasis. What does that mean? Why do we keep sugar in our blood? Our brain, my brain needs it. My brain needs it. Your brain needs it. All our brains need it. But we need ATP. So why keep it in the blood? It's easily accessible. Because it's easily accessible. It's right there. Blood comes in contact with pretty much every tissue in the body. Every cell in the body is going to need some of this glucose. You're going to have to make energy. You've got fake ATP. So why not keep it in the blood right there? We just got to maintain a certain amount. Remember, this is solid, right? Not this. Okay, yeah, this too. But glucose is solid. It's a solid particle. What happens when we start putting a lot of solid particles into a liquid? What happens when you put a lot of solutes into a solid? We need a solution. Yeah, we well, definitely. Don't, we change the, we'll change the volume, won't we? Because we're going to bring in more water. We put more solid particles in. Remember osmosis? We're going to change the volume. If we change the volume in a restricted space, we're going to increase pressure. Make sense? So we got to be careful with how much sugar. We can't just keep too much in. That's going to be bad. But we can't keep it too low either. Because then when the cells need it, they're like looking around for it. It's on its way, is what they'll say. They always say that. <laughs> All right. We talked about homeostasis, we talked about negative feedback. Very nice, very familiar picture. Thermostat, right? Uh, it's too cold. Thermostat kicks on, sends a message to the furnace, says heat up the room, and now we're <coughs> warm again, just as it should be. Negative feedback. Well, it's feed forward or uh, positive feedback. Classic example is mom's uterus. Mom's uterus gets this message to contract or of oxytocin. So the uterus contracts, says, okay, I got your message, uh, posterior pituitary gland, now send me more. So that's why it keeps sending the message back. The uterus keeps sending the message back saying, I got your message, keep sending more. I got your message, keep sending more. And then those contractions are going to become stronger and a shorter time in between. And eventually they're going to kick that baby out. So that's a classic example. Baby is ready to be born. A signal tells the hypothalamus to release oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. Although it's not made in the posterior pituitary gland, is it? Where is it made? Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. It's a hormone that's directly controlled by the nervous system. Hear about that from the adrenal glands? There we go. The adrenal glands located on a superior aspect of each of the two kidneys, you'll notice has an outer cortex and an inner medulla. What you can't see in that picture is that the cortex is actually divided into these three zona layers. Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. In here, these three layers. Each of those layers is responsible for uh, releasing different types of hormones, different groups of hormones. Uh, the mineral corticoids, the glucocorticoids, and the uh, androgens, respectively. So even though you're only seeing two layers there, cortex and medulla, understand the cortex actually is divided into three different layers. Kind of important when it comes time to talk about the uh, adrenal corticotropic hormone. That is released. Okay, hormones are under hormonal control. We get that with a lot of uh, releasing hormones. And humoral control with 
things like uh, blood or some other fluid. Okay, where is... Not enough of a hormone, hyposecretion, too much of a hormone, hypersecretion. But there are so many variables that can cause this. Uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult than it sounds, trying to figure out you know, what each one does. We know the hypothalamus is part of the diencephalon. We know it's part of the central nervous system. Hypothalamus controls a lot of stuff, including hunger, thirst, fluid, temperature, etc. It has a lot of releasing hormones that it can release to other things, to tell other organs or other glands to do something. Starting with the pituitary, part of the, it's referred to as the master gland. It does a lot. Posterior pituitary, also known as the uh, neurohypophysis, is going to release antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. All right, first of all, what does a diuretic drug do? Take the water out of your blood. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> Gets the water out of the body, makes you pee, dehydrates the body. Removes water from the body. Yes, this is all true. Decreases volume. Lowers your blood pressure. Decreases volume. That'll lower your blood It'll pressure. It'll lower your blood pressure. Lowers mine. Yeah. It lowers mine, but that's not true. Oh, yeah, but a little bit. All right, so we know what diuretics do, right? It makes you pee. The um, hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, that people take. They call it their water pill, right? They call it their makes you pee pill, because that's really what it does. It makes the person lose more water. That's what diuretics do. Diuretics make the person lose more water. So, if we have something, a hormone here, called the antidiuretic hormone, what's that going to cause the body to do? Pain. It's going to cause the body to hold more water. Understand, when your kidneys are filtering your blood, <coughs> a lot of water is lost. A whole bunch of water gets lost out of your kidneys. But, before it has the chance to become urine, it gets reabsorbed back into the blood. About 98% of the water that gets filtered out gets reabsorbed back in by things like the antidiuretic hormone, opening up water channels, getting the water to get come back into the body. Maintains a certain volume of water in our body, which of course will maintain a certain blood pressure as well. Is that largely in your large intestines where you reabsorb water? No. No, not no. This is in the kidneys. This is all in the nephron. We're, we're filtering out a lot more water in our kidneys right now. A ton more. You have no idea how much, but a lot. Uh, large intestines is sort of the last spot to help with, with uh, water control to you know, absorb more or not. Oh, okay. Um, with regard to the antidiuretic hormone, this hormone keeps you from peeing out too much water. It keeps water in your body, right? There are two things that you need to know about that inhibit the antidiuretic hormone. One of those things is called caffeine. So when people drink a lot of coffee or a lot of soda with caffeine or a lot of Red Bulls, it will cause them to hold on to, uh, not hold on to, it will cause them to release more water. They'll pee more. It'll block the antidiuretic <coughs> hormone. Caffeine blocks the antidiuretic hormone. In other words, what stops you from peeing gets blocked. It stops what stops you from peeing. Therefore, you pee more. It stops the stopping of peeing. The stop stop peeing drug. This is why when we come across patients who are suddenly peeing a lot more, uh, one of the things, especially like 12, 13, 14 year olds, you have to ask them, you know, you 
drinking a lot more Red Bulls now? Have you discovered Red Bulls? Or some other soda? Also, when people are out on those um, 98 degree days in the summertime with high humidity, they're walking around the park at the zoo or something, and they're just sweating buckets, and they go over and they're getting something to drink to replenish what they've lost. Uh, some people don't make really great choices, and instead they go right for like a Coca-Cola or something with caffeine in it. So even though they're getting some water in, the caffeine sort of like not helping a whole lot with that. You want to get water back into them and some sugar. Sugar's okay in that situation, or in that situation. We'd say that. Get them a Sprite, you know, something with no caffeine, a little bit of sugar and some salt in it. The other thing that blocks antidiuretic hormone is alcohol. Alcohol blocks the antidiuretic hormone. So if the antidiuretic hormone stops you from peeing, alcohol is going to block what's stopping you from peeing, which means you're going to pee more. Not just about the volume you're putting in your body, but you're also blocking the antidiuretic hormone. So now we have to ask that 12 or 13 or 14 year old who's suddenly peeing a lot more. Did you find Red Bulls? Did you find vodka and Red Bulls? Now, you can imagine, this is going to contribute to that hangover the next day. Dehydrated. Dehydrated. So if somebody's drinking vodka and Red Bulls, it's going to increase the effect. All right. Now, of course, 12, 13, 14 year olds suddenly start peeing a lot more. We're also going to want to check their blood sugar, right? One of the things we see in diabetes. All right, oxytocin. Here's a good one. I love oxytocin, man. Oxytocin is so useful. Oxytocin is going to cause that uterus to contract when that baby wants out. Well, the baby doesn't know it wants out. When it gets to a certain size, up to about 3,500 grams, it's going to send that signal. So, okay, we, got, we go on to this baby out. Remember, remember, the baby has nothing to do with it. The baby does not crawl or kick or, or uh, climb its way out. The baby's being squeezed out by the uterus. So that oxytocin is squeezing that baby out like it would squeeze toothpaste out of a tube. <coughs> if mom's contractions aren't strong enough, and if they're not frequent <coughs> enough, and quite frankly, I've got stuff to do. I can speed things up. Because I can get oxytocin off of the shelf, as I like to say. So what do we call it? What do we call it? Pitocin. Oxytocin off the shelf, we call pitocin. If it comes from mom's brain to mom's uterus, it is endogenous oxytocin. If it comes off the shelf to mom's uterus, <coughs> it is exogenous oxytocin, or we call it pitocin. And pitocin is great for that, speeding things up. <laughs> now, if mom delivers the baby, and mom delivers the placenta, and mom is still bleeding, we're going to want to control the bleeding. And as you first responders know, if somebody gets a slice across their arm like that and blood's coming out, what do you do? Pressure. First thing you do, pressure. you put pressure on it. Well, if mom delivers her baby, or mom delivers her placenta, and mom is bleeding from the uterus, we're going to want to stop the bleeding. But how are we going to stop the bleeding? Massage. Wait, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. Can we are going to make the uterus contract on itself, putting pressure on itself. We're going to get a more pitocin. We can also try some external pressure. That's why you see the doctor rubbing her belly. It's not for good luck. Not good luck. Good luck. <laughs> the reason that the reason. You're going to rub that belly is because we want to trick the uterus into thinking there's still something inside. If there's still something inside, then it needs to get pushed out. If it needs to get pushed out, what's it going to use? Oxytocin. 
try that as well. And at what other time do we see uh, strong uterus contractions? Menstrual. No, strong uterus contractions. Oh. I, I didn't hear if anybody else had an answer. If you said it at the same time and then I say it, don't say to me, I said that. Because mm -hmm. nine people say different things at once, it's all white noise. Cancel each other out. How about the female orgasm? I knew it. Somebody was going to say that. Live. Female orgasm. Um, this is actually suggested that this is going to cause the cervix to sort of dip down into the uterus more, to help collect the ejaculate, to pull it up, get it into the cervical loss, to start getting the swimmers up the fallopian tubes. So it would make sense then that if mom is slowly dilating, really slowly, contractions are really weak, one of the things that they'll sometimes tell mom to do is they'll tell mom and dad to go home, leave the hospital, go home, put on some music, turn the lights down low, <coughs> little very white, Get things started. Because what we want to do is we want to kick start that uterus. Get a little bit of oxytocin flowing. That's the idea. And ask anyone who has tried this, and they will tell you it is effective. Very often is effective. Oxytocin. Oxytocin. We love oxytocin. Oxytocin is your friend. Okay, we just saw that. There are water channels where the antidiuretic hormone works on. Oxytocin is also responsible for the ejection of milk from the breast. What's called a letdown reflex. And this happens when mom starts breastfeeding, when the baby starts sucking, or if mom hears the baby crying in the other room. That's pretty amazing. That a baby crying in the other room can send a message to mom's brain that says, all right, we gotta start getting the milk out. In males, don't know. Anterior pituitary gland, also known as the adenohypophysis. <laughs> Also under control of the hypothalamus. How do we skip growth hormone? Okay. Growth hormone is one of the hormones released from the um, anterior pituitary gland. Here's the thing about growth hormone, okay? All the books will tell you that growth hormone works on all the cells that are capable of growing, causing them to grow. And that's sort of true, but not exactly. Because first it actually has to go to the liver. And the liver then releases a hormone called somatomethin. Somatomethin then goes on to act on all the cells uh, that, can, that are capable of growth to grow. So it doesn't act directly. But if you understand that eventually growth hormone will cause all cells that are capable of growth to grow, then that's fine. Too much growth hormone in childhood or puberty is going to cause the person to grow very, very tall. We're talking like seven foot nine. Very, very tall. That's what we call gigantism. This is a problem, actually, because as they grow, their organs try to keep up, including their heart and lungs. So we see cardiomegaly occur. We see a curvature of the spine. We see the um, thoracic cavity expand. And quite frankly, it can't keep up. They usually die in their 20s. So anytime you see these specials on TV where they say uh, the tallest girl in the world, she's 15 years old, she's 7 foot 5, or the tallest boy in the world, he's 16, he's 7 foot 8. 
And then they'll say something like, oh, but he needs to have an operation or else he'll die. It's not an operation where they just have to cut his legs off to shorten them. It's an operation to remove a tumor because there's something causing his body to release all this excess growth hormone or all her excess growth hormone. So they have to remove the tumor, so you don't have a pituitary tumor. Now, here's the thing though. If somebody has an excess release of growth hormone, but it's after puberty, then we're gonna see different changes. Because they're not gonna grow any taller. If it's after puberty, that means their epiphyseal growth plates have fused. So there will be no more longitudinal bone growth. So they won't grow any taller. So what happens to them? I'm sorry? They get bigger around. They get bigger around, sort of, yes. You'll see their wedding ring doesn't fit anymore, not even close, they have to cut it off. Their fingers are huge around this way. Their jaw sort of squares up. Um, their shoes, are, they have to get the wide and the double wide sizes. Their hats don't fit anymore. They have to keep loosening the bands on them. Uh, this is called acromegaly. Acromegaly is a release of growth hormone in adults after puberty. If it happens before puberty, we call it gigantism. Giantism or gigantism. Too much growth hormone. <coughs> Acromegaly occurs in adults, so they do not grow any taller. Their features certainly change. Gigantism in children, they grow tall. They die early. What about dwarfism? Well, this could be the result of not enough growth hormone, and that would make sense. However, there's somewhere around 200 different types of dwarfism. There's two, two classifications, but there's about 200 different types. And the classifications you're probably already familiar with. The classification of dwarfism, you're probably already familiar with. You've seen this before. You ever notice how, in some cases, with, with patients who have uh, <coughs> dwarfism, dwarfism, their bodies seem out of proportionate? Like their arms seem short, or their torso seems long, or their head seems big, or something seems out of proportionate? Disproportionate? Uh, and then there is the proportionate sort of dwarfism, where they just look like a small person. Everything else is in proportion. So there's two classifications, but there's actually over 200 different types of dwarfism. There's a lot. Basically, it's any adult that's under four foot ten. That's so big. Okay, read about Robert Wadlow, one of the tallest men to ever live. Very important. <laughs> don't, don't read about that. There's a really nice um, example, a skeleton down at the Mutra Museum. Have you been to the Mutra Museum downtown? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a really good example of a skeleton of a patient who has um, Gigantism. There's also a patient who had, right next to it who had a dwarfism, a chondroplasia. All right. Notice here some of the hypothalamic uh, hormones. Notice in their names. It tells you kind of what they do. Releasing or inhibiting, releasing, releasing, releasing. From the hypothalamus, is going out somewhere else. So, starting over here, we have all these different options to release, 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 inhibit, inhibit. So it's sending out this message. Here's what I want you to do. It goes on to the next one. It goes to the pituitary gland, posterior pituitary, ADH and oxytocin, which are actually made here, was stored and then released from here. 
growth hormone we talked about. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. So thyroid releasing hormone to thyroid, the thyroid stimulates to the anterior pituitary gland. Anterior pituitary gland releases thyroid stimulating hormone onto the thyroid gland, which is going to release T3 and T4. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, this is going to act on the adrenal glands to release things like the mineral corticoids or the glucocorticoids. Uh, prolactin, prolactin is about milk production. It's also about breast tissue production early on. Uh, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, LH and FSH. These two are ordered often referred to as gonadotropins. They are the hormones of the gonads, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. They are going to tell the ovaries when to release eggs. They're going to tell the ovary when to release progesterone or estrogen. And they're going to tell the testes when to release sperm, as well as, well, when to make sperm and how much to make, I should say, and when to make um, testosterone and interstitial cells. Here's something that I always want to remind paramedic students of. ADH is also called a vasopressor, because you'll still hear about medications out there they call vasopressors. <clears throat> Think about what this does. If the antidiuretic hormone it's the antidiuretic hormone. If that stops you from losing a lot of water, what does that mean for volume? Increases. Increases. So what does that mean for pressure? Increases. Increases. So if somebody handed you a medication on a truck one day and said, here, here's a vasopressor, you could say, okay, well, I have no idea what the name of this is. I've never seen this before. But if it's a vasopressor, then it must be something that's going to increase volume and therefore increase pressure. Does that make sense? Remember, blood pressure, the way the body regulates blood pressure is one of two ways, either by volume or by resistance. That's it. The body regulates blood pressure by volume or by resistance, which means every single drug that we give a patient to change or alter their blood pressure is either going to alter it via volume or resistance. Oh. Okay, ADH causes increased reabsorption of water in the kidneys, vasoconstriction of peripheral vessels. Both of these increase blood pressure. Vasopressin may be used in certain types of cardiac arrest as an alternative to epinephrine. Here is a nice little chart showing all of the hormones coming from the hypothalamus. Again, notice all the R's, R's, and the I's for inhibiting. Gonadotropin, that's what the small end here. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. And it has a nice uh, picture shows you where all these things go. Melanocyte stimulating hormone. Oh, we didn't talk about that one, did we then? Melanocyte stimulating hormone. It stimulates melanocytes, make pigment. This is what gets activated when she's pregnant. It causes her to uh, get that mask of pregnancy. We talk about that, the chalasma, hyperpigmentation on the face, it's called chalasma, or mask of pregnancy. And she'll also get this nice dark line right down her abdomen, from the umbilicus down, called a linea nigra. They're both considered benign. They'll clear, uh, should clear up after the pregnancy. Again, unknown function in there. Thyroid gland is located in the anterior portion of the neck and is butterfly shaped. It's a very good picture. I know they have. There's. Notice right here, this is the uh, cartilage that surrounds the vocal cord, basically. It's the laryngeal cartilage. And the bump part right out in front is called the laryngeal prominence, right here. Everybody has a laryngeal prominence, but men just have a much more obvious laryngeal prominence, which is how it got the name Adam's apple. So if you can figure out where the laryngeal prominence is, and you go down, sort of put your fingers on either side of your throat, and then swallow, 
you'll feel the thyroid sort of move up. <coughs> These two lobes connected by this isthmus surrounding the trachea. If we spin it around, we can see the parathyroid glands located posteriorly or mostly posteriorly. Two, three, four of them there. Thyroidine is T3, thyroxine is T4. Calcitonin is going to help get calcium uh, into the bones, out of the blood. We will see a lot, we'll see uh, in a little bit here, I think they talk about hypo and hyperthyroidism. You're going to know somebody with, with this. Chances are somebody close. There's a good possibility you're going to have a family member, a relative, somebody's going to be diagnosed with either hyper or hypothyroidism. Look at this. Parathyroid hormone. If calcium levels get too low, calcium levels meaning calcium in the blood. Parathyroid glands stimulate to release parathyroid hormone, which stimulates bone dissolving cells. Those sound like osteoclasts to me and release calcium into the blood. I don't know why, maybe a clinical application. Jay is a healthy 25-year-old school teacher starting her first job and she began having strange symptoms. Probably conjunctivitis, pink eye, and pinworms, including a rapid heart rate, profuse sweating, and constant hunger. Initially, she thought they were caused by stress. More alarming symptoms appeared that mood. Developed insomnia, couldn't concentrate, couldn't focus. I can't even read through the rest of this. Hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. Let me tell you what hyperthyroidism does it speeds things up. Hyperthyroidism speeds things up. So if your metabolism is supposed to be running at a certain rate, Hyperthyroidism is going to increase that rate. If you run a car engine like this instead of like this, are you going to be burning more fuel or less? More. You're going to be burning more fuel. So do you think these patients are going to be overweight or underweight? Under. I'm sorry? Under. Under. They're burning fuel, right? Burning through the fuel. So. What do you think their heart rate's gonna be like, fast or slow? Fast. All right, tachycardic, there's some palpitations. These people are gonna be sitting in the classroom. Always having energy, right? Always doing something, always moving around, always tapping their feet. And they're sitting in here going, warm in here. Can we open a window? And the rest of us are like, you're crazy. It is cold in here. Well, now it's getting better. But it is cold in here. They have an intolerance to heat. Why do they have an intolerance to heat? Well, remember, if they're running their engines like this, aren't they producing more heat than we are? Which means their body temperature is going to be a little bit elevated. How are things moving through their <coughs> digestive system? Fast. They don't have time to absorb anything. Get it through, get it out. They are running to the bathroom with diarrhea. They're thin, hearts racing, palpitations. <coughs> Always a little bit warmer than the rest of us. Now the problem is that they can have something called a thyroid storm. Now this is dangerous. Because if they already have a fast heart rate, and their body just says, you know what, let's send out a blizzard of T3 and T4. Uh, that can lead to fibrillations and death. So that can be dangerous. The thing about Graves' disease, you can see these people. They have something called exophthalmus, where they have this staring expression. Their eyes are always, you know, when you look at somebody's eyes, if you look at their eyes, you'll notice you can't see the entire iris, right? 
you only see part of their iris. So these patients with Graves' disease are very common, you'll see this. 